Thank you, Steve, for leading us thus far. I was just thinking that uh, a good indication of a healthy church, which is you, its people, is when they have a high view of God and they have a high view of Scripture. And our songs this morning have certainly portrayed that, a high view of God and a high view of Scripture. So thank you for leading us thus far. Let's continue in our worship by opening the Scriptures to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to continue in our series. And uh, as we will see, it's out with the old and in with the new. And uh, we'll look into that. We're just going to read a few verses. And uh, we'll pick up at verse 7. We will be reading a few verses prior to that as we get into our message. But verse 7 of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians says, But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail? To be even more with glory. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Trust God will add a blessing to his word this morning. As we have discussed in past weeks, Paul, here in this massive apostolic digression, this massive amount of scripture that is in parenthesis, what he does in chapter 2, or halfway through chapter 2, right through uh, to chapter 7, is defending the ministry of the gospel. The ministry of the gospel was being attacked. And Paul is not concerned about attacks that come on him personally, but he is vitally concerned when those attacks affect the ministry of the gospel. And so in this section, even today, he's defending the ministry of the gospel, which he and the team preached, and in this case, specifically in this city or at the church of Corinth. Out with the old and in with the new. A bit of a play on words there owing to our old year gone and new year come in, but I haven't forced the text to make it so. You will see it as it comes in. But a normal action in our lives and one that passes by so often without a thought is that we are daily dividing history. Do you realize that? You know, whether it be celebrating the new year and seeing the old out, etc., like some of us have done or in business, or filling out those horrible forms that we have to do for so many things these days, or or looking at our diaries and dates that we need to keep. We're always dividing history with a before and after date. Everything we do and know acknowledges a division in history of either a before or after Christ demarcation line. Can't get away from it. And in our section this morning, the Apostle Paul is doing exactly the same thing. He divides history based on the coming or the incarnation of Christ and his work at Calvary. That's the demarcation line that he sets. And he cites this division as the new covenant. That's what he calls it, the new covenant. Because Jesus' coming ended one ministry and began another. And why this division of history is so important it is because through the coming and the cross of Jesus Christ, there was something new that was brought into being. And that something new is a declaration of our freedom. Freedom from the old declaration of condemnation that we see so clearly in the law of God. But now there is freedom offered to all those who come to him in faith. And so this is good news. This is the gospel. And because of the gospel, believers, those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, can now live victoriously in him. 
This is what the Apostle Paul says in, First Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 2, just prior our reading, in 14. This is what he says. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And we talked about that a couple of weeks back. And so he's living victoriously in this newfound freedom that only comes, only, I might say, in and through Jesus Christ and faith in him. No way else, as we will see. And so Paul summarizes this hope, his hope and, and his longing and his desire of living triumphantly through this freedom found in Christ. And he summarizes that in, in verses 4 to 6 that we just haven't read. And this is what it says. Such confidence, Paul says, we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. There you have it. Of a new covenant. So a new covenant has been ushered in and not only that, it has been ratified. How was it ratified? It has been ratified by the death and the poured out life of, our, of the Jesus Christ at Calvary. It's an entirely new covenant that's been ratified by his son. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8, and that will really confirm that. And those of us who have repented of our sins and, and believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, what this means is that the covenant that Jeremiah, 1,500 years or so before, prophesied is truly ours. And what is that covenant? This covenant is this. This is what Jeremiah the prophet said. I will be their God and they shall be my people, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. What an awesome position to be in, right? Every single one of us here would have to say that, yes, I want my sins forgiven. I don't want my sin ever to be held against me. I'm sure every single one of us would say that. And so this is wonderful news. The believer, the one who has come to Christ, can rest in this wonderful new covenant promise that Jeremiah prophesied and that was ushered in by Jesus Christ and ratified by the shedding of his own precious blood. But what about now? This is the question. What about now, folks? We love the gospel truth, how salvation has given us freedom and victory over sin and its wages... We love that right, truth. We relish in it. We sing about it as we've done this morning. But why, can I ask, why is it, and I ask myself, why is it that living triumphantly in the victory and freedom that Jesus has given, why is it so difficult? And why is it difficult at times when it should not be? You know this, and I know this, that it's difficult. Well, the church that the Apostle Paul planted in the city of Corinth, they dealt with the same issue. You see, what happened when Paul taught the gospel of freedom in Christ, they responded, many of them responded in repentance and faith, and we read of that last week, Paul cites that, uh, that uh, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and in the spirit of our God, and he talks about their sin, and he says, such were some of you, so there had been a radical change in their lives. There could be a complete turnaround from one way of life to another. The new covenant had dawned upon them and become a reality in their life, so whereby they were now free in Christ. But what happens is, and what happened in Corinth, I should say, that self-appointed spiritual gurus or spiritual leaders came in amongst them like wolves in sheep's clothing. And they presented a counterfeit gospel. This goes on all the time, by the way. These so-called Judaizers, they were not servants of the new covenant, but they represented what Paul refers to as an old covenant approach to life and ministry. The Judaizers taught, this is what they taught, they taught that salvation, yes, we'll accept that, is by faith in Jesus Christ, plus keeping the Old Testament law of Moses. Things like circumcision, things like special feasts, things like festivals and new moons, etc., etc. All the old law had to be added, so they said. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul calls these people a certain name. He calls them peddlers, and we talked about that, what that really means. They were peddlers of God's word. 
In other words, they watered down the truth and made it what it should not be. And he also says that they preach another Jesus who encouraged the church to receive a different spirit and a different gospel. We see that in chapter 11 of this book in verse 4. And this gospel plus works is called legalism. It was attractive to the Corinthians and sad to say it continues to be popular among many churches and many professing Christians today. It's a bit like another norm. We often see that we get a bit, when we get a bit older, and some of us here are a bit older, including myself, and as you get a bit older, there is often it crops up that we hanker after the old days, right? We hanker after the old days. And what we do is we admire the past and, 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 we, and we, we treat the modern with rejection or at least suspicion as we admire the old days. But then again, as we look at our world today, can you really blame us, young people? Okay. Can you really blame us? Anyway, this is exactly what the Corinthian church were falling into in respect to the new covenant faith. Under the direction of these false teachers in the church. They were admiring the old days. And they probably had a good more reason and probably excuse, can I say, to do this than we do today. Even culturally, history was honoured and anything new was considered suspect. It's interesting that today... People consider Christianity dodgy because of its antiquity, right? Whereas in Paul's day, it was history that, that people loved to venerate and, and, and hold up as something that would give them religious stability. That's what it really was. Even Caesario, he was a, a Roman philosopher, a pagan. But his pagan philosophy permeated culture. And this is what he said. Ancient times were the closest to the gods. And so here's this veneration of the old ways and treating anything new with suspicion and maybe even throwing it out. Hence, here were these false teachers protesting against the new covenant. The new covenant of the gospel. And they were advocating that we need to hold on to the old ways of the law of Moses in addition to faith in Christ alone for salvation. That's what they were doing. This brings us back to why we as Christians struggle to live triumphantly in the, in the victory and freedom that Jesus has given us. We struggle, folks, because we fail to believe our adequacy for life and ministry is in Christ alone and not in our natural resources and abilities. That's why we struggle. We try and cut it alone. We try and forge ahead. We try and do what we think we can do for God. And we seem to gravitate toward this doing kind of stuff that our human nature enjoys. Achieving religious goals in our own steam seems to be a natural gravitation for many of us. After all, it's easier to measure religious activity rather than simply trust Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to express himself through us, right? Now, I'm not talking about here a let go and let God, case it ass, case it ass kind of thing. No, no, no. As Christians, because we are indwelt by the Spirit of God, we will have a desire and a longing to serve God and to emulate Jesus Christ and to, and to live and be more like Him. We will have that desire. And as we read the Scriptures, our, our minds are enlightened and we're strengthened. Well, that's what we must allow to work through us. Whereas many churches, many religions whether they're Eastern, whether they're Western, so many will think the otherwise, that it's what you do. It's this that you attend. It's this that what you do and that. And they have all these rules and regulations. If we do this and we do that and we do this and we do that, it will be accounted for our righteousness. That's a lie of the devil, folks. It's a lie of the devil. But as human beings, we love to tick boxes, don't we, when we do stuff. 
Faith plus work seems to cut it and satisfy our natural religious egos. And even if you're not a Christian here this morning, let me tell you, you are a religious person. Every single person is born is a religious person. They have a faith in something. It could be in themselves, it could be in some spiritual leader or guru or whatever, or it could even be in a, in, in a church. You will have some faith in something. But unless you have faith in Jesus Christ, you will never be declared righteous before God. So Paul in this section refutes this false gospel. He refutes it. This gospel of faith plus works. And how he does this is... He compares and contrasts the old covenant with the new covenant. And it's clearly out with the old and in with the new. Our first one is choose life, not death. And we see this in the last part of chapter 6 and right through to the first part of chapter 7. And what we did is we learned last week that it's only by accepting Jesus Christ that any person is justified and declared righteous through the work of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at that. This means that God's law is written, that was written on tablets of stone can never give and never were intended to give anyone salvation and peace with God. And as you know, when we talk about God's law written on tables of stones, that's what happened. You remember know, Moses, the man of God who went up on the mountain of Sinai, and there he was 40 days, and then with the finger of God, the law of God was written on these tables of stones, and, Mo and Moses came down the mountain, and there what we know is the Ten Commandments were given to the people. This is the law. And, of course, they had lots of associated laws with that, springing out from that. And so this law of God that was given to Moses was so misunderstood in Paul's day, and dare I say, it still is an ours. You go to the person out in the street and you say, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? And I say, well, I try to be good. I try to keep the Ten Commandments or something like that. They'll even know about the Ten Commandments. This is what they were doing in Paul's day or trying to do. This is what these Judaizers were promoting and Paul says, no, 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 it's wrong. People tend to think that a list of rules and regulations are those which if they keep, they can earn acceptance with God and peace with God. But as I said, that is completely wrong. You know, the Ten Commandments and God's laws, or maybe your own laws that you have set up for yourself, or maybe a religion's laws that you are following that has nothing to do with Christ, you know what it'll do? It'll only do one thing, just like the law that was given to Moses. You know, there's only, it'll only do one thing. You know what it'll do? It'll kill you. That's all it'll do. Because there was only, there's only been one person ever that's walked this earth that's ever kept the holy law of God perfectly, and that is Jesus Christ and him alone. Hence, to break this law that God gave Moses is to sign our own death warrant, which we all have. We all have signed our own death warrant because we were born in sin and shape and in iniquity. Even a little baby throws a paddy. Where did it learn that from? It didn't learn it from a mum and dad because it's not old enough. But it throws a paddy, gets angry, spits the dummy because of its nature. That little sinner needs saving. Born in sin and shape and iniquity. And it doesn't take too long for any of us to live out that sinful nature with thoughts and deeds and actions, okay? As a matter of fact, the law of God given to Moses, as I said before, only kills us. Why is that? Well, it does it in three ways. It first kills any joy and peace and hope that we might have and fills that void with frustration and hopelessness and guilt because of our inability to fulfill the law of God. I've met men down through the years who have lived their whole life trying to keep the law of God, thinking that will earn them favor with God. Just on that basis alone. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It only kills. Secondly, it kills because of our inability to keep God's perfect law. And what it does, it executes justice, with, which is spiritual death. So God's law says, here's my law, you break it and you will die. Spiritual death. 
What does Romans um, 6.23 say? The wages of sin is death. So God's law executes perfect justice. And also creates in us, as I said first, a frustration and a hopelessness and a guilt because we, we, we cannot keep it. And thirdly, God's violated law kills and that it becomes a basis of eternal condemnation. In other words, because that we cannot keep God's law, God is perfectly just in metering out eternal condemnation for anyone trying to keep that law in order to be made acceptable because they can't. So those who try and earn God's acceptance by being good or keeping the Ten Commandments, I'll spell it out, are using the law of God in a very wrong way. Instead of discovering that the law of God is impossible to keep and, and designed purely to become, what does Galatians 3.24 say? Designed purely to become our tutor or our school teacher or schoolmaster to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. That's the design of God's law. And people who try and foolishly keep it to earn salvation, all they'll find out it'll kill them. The law is truly a ministry of death. Ministry of death to those who fill their lives up with religious ceremonies and festivals and, and personal opinions about how everything should go in hope that these things will make them right with God. It's a ministry of death. You know, Paul reminded the Roman church of this in chapter 10, verse 3 to 4 in the, in the letter that he wrote them. This is what he says. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of, of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Do you hear that? The end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But please note the contrast here of the old and the new here in our text. I'm sure you would have noticed them. Paul brings it to our attention first in verse 6 where it says the letter or the law kills and this, there's the contrast in the spirit gives life. So the letter kills and the spirit gives life. And then we see in verse 7 he calls the law the, the ministry of death in contrast to the ministry of, of the Spirit in verse 8. And then in verse 9, we see the law is called what? The ministry of condemnation. And the new covenant is tagged with the ministry of righteousness. So we have contrast, comparison contrast all the way through this little section. And so it's pretty simple, folks. Just let me reiterate it once again. The law of God given through Moses only ever brings condemnation to those who break it. And we all have and do break it. Eternal life and forgiveness come through the ministry of the Spirit. We see this in verse 8. This contrast demands that we choose life in the new covenant. Or we'll end up experiencing the full force of God's law under the old covenant. And the full force is eternal death, eternal separation in hell. Paul continues to compare the old and new covenant even further though. He explains that the new is superior to the old, hence we should what? Choose righteousness, not condemnation. And we have this in from verse second part of verse 7 right through to 10. And he argues this on three counts. And the first count is is found in verse 7, and that the ministry of the Spirit being more splendid than the ministry that brought death. Now, the ministry of the death here is defined in, as letters engraved on stones or the Ten Commandments, as I talked about before. Yet this ministry of death given to mankind through the man of God called Moses, it had some glory. You see that? It had some glory. Remember when Moses descended from the mountain? You might remember the story. If you don't, just let me reiterate it briefly. Moses went up into the mountain, and there he was with God. God communed with him. He was in the presence of God, and, and the whole mountain was covered with smoke and fire and so forth. And even the people dared not go near or touch the mountain because God says if they do, they'll be killed straight away. And so there was, this was an awesome time in, 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 in the history of the world where Moses received these commandments and the law of God. 
And while he was up there, Moses was up there communing with God, some of God's glory brushed off onto this ordinary man. Isn't that awesome? Some of it brushed off. And, and, and that glory that brushed off onto Moses impacted the people immensely. Imagine that. Imagine that. Steve or Peter or Bill or myself communing with God and you being able to see in me physically and these men that they'd been with God. Because what did they see in Moses? They saw that he had a shiny face, right? He came back and his face literally intangibly glowed. It glowed so much that he had to put a veil over it because the people couldn't look upon this brush off of the glory of God. But the problem was this glory faded somewhat. Over time, it faded and Moses' face lost the glow. After all, he was only an ordinary man, right? And uh, until he would go into the presence of God again, and by that stage in the tabernacle, and he had come out and his face would be all aglow again. And Moses shone forth something of God's glory. And on that basis, when they saw that glory that was emanating from this man of God, Moses, the people were directed to follow all the external re regulations and rituals and sacrifices that God's law through Moses demanded. That was their kind of cue that, wow, this is for real. That don't happen because of anything else. This man has been with God. And the law he's got is from God. But folks, believers in the new covenant of Jesus Christ... Every single one of us, not just the pastor or the elders, every single one of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ have an inward glory. Do you know that? We have an inward glory that directs us because God lives within us and his indwelling of us is permanent. I love this. If this ministry of death so manifested the glory of God, what verse 8 asks is, will not the ministry of the Spirit be far more glorious? Or in other words, how, what the Scripture says is, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even with more glory? In other words, because Moses' glory was a fading glory, the argument advances the superiority of the unfailing and unfailing new covenant. This is much better. And so the glory of the old covenant, because it was fading, it was only temporary, is not to be compared to the glory of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit's new covenant glory first shone, by the way, it first shone at the conception of our Lord Jesus Christ and at his birth. And then we read how Jesus' face shone at the transfiguration. Remember that? And then Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. And Luke records this for us in 1, chapter 179. And he says, Jesus came to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus displayed and manifested the glory of God. Isn't that awesome? And we behold him. And we behold him this morning. One is, who is full of grace and peace. But what about now? I can't see a tangible Jesus sitting in the front seat. He's in heaven. We see him by faith, absolutely. We see him by faith, but the Lord's not happy with that. He's left you and me here as Christians, as believers, though we're filled with the glory of his presence. Now he shines from within us. The very light of God's presence, it should and needs fill our souls and, and, and enable us, as we have looked at in the last week, to be a sweet aroma of Christ. Remember that? And enables us to be a, a, a letter of Christ that spells out and we're read like books that emanates and shines forth something of the glory of God. Now how awesome is that, folks? 
Moses may have had a glowing face, but those who believe in the new covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? We are wrapped in robes of righteousness. According to Isaiah 61 and 10, we are wrapped in robes of righteousness and we should glow. This unfading righteousness of God, it, with the scripture tells us, it has been imputed to us. It has been credited to our account. We not only have our sins forgiven, but our whole ledger of life has been credited with the righteousness of Christ. Now, you cannot get anything better than that. And let me tell you, that should shine. That should shine. And how will it shine? I'll tell you how it shines. shine. It will be evidence in our lives that will impact people. Just like Moses impacted the people immensely when they saw his face glowing. Our lives should and need to and will, if we are really in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, will immensely pack and impact people. You see, look, folks, as we see in verse 9, the ministry of righteousness, it was designed to abound in glory. We should be those folks who are oozing with the glory of God's new covenant. Oozing with it. A bit like Spurgeon, you know. Uh, he, he, he referred to, or someone referred to him as, if you pricked him, he bled Bibline because he was so full of the scriptures. That's what we should be. If we valued and, and, and were taken deeper into the glory of Christ. So what should this look like? What should, what should people see in us? A shiny face like Moses? I doubt it. Something much better. Something much better. Surely it will be a ministry of the Spirit, right? Are we not indwelt with the Spirit of God permanently that doesn't fade? And so let me take you to Galatians 5. We will ooze and we will it can't have, be bubbling over things like love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All those things should be bubbling over and see. Now I'll tell you, if you lived in the Spirit and those attributes were flowing from us, you would impact people immensely. That kind of living is more impacting than a shiny face, I might say. So we ask ourselves the question, are those spirit-born qualities filling and overflowing in my life? They should be. They should be. They need to be. That's the very least we can do for the Lord who's, who's done so much for us. Amen? Are they? Are those characteristics, the, the content of the letter of my life? Are they the characteristics of the fragrance to a watching world and to God and to Christ? You see, folks, the old covenant, the law, commanded righteousness. The new covenant shows it off. The old covenant made people to be hearers of the truth. The new covenant enables believers to live out that truth and be doers of it. That's the difference. That's the difference. So back to our original question. Why do we struggle living triumphantly in the victory and freedom that Jesus has given to us? Why do we? Can I suggest it's because we tend to lean so much on our own ability to produce this righteousness, even as Christians. We can fall into this. Rather than believe and allow the righteousness of Christ within, through the word of God, to have its way in us. And to be lived out to manifest the superior glory of God. The second argument for superiority of the new covenant is found in verse 9. And that is the ministry that brings righteousness is more splendid than the ministry of condemnation. The other one was it was more splendid than the ministry that brought death. This is more splendid then the ministry that brings condemnation it says this, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. And so we know that the law was not given for the purpose of salvation. It wasn't. But it only produces a woeful condemnation to all mankind. And our condemnation is based on our guilt of sin and our inability to pay the price of being set free from it. And we have that in Colossians 2.14 if you want to look up that verse up. 
And so this condemnation that we're all under as sinners in the sight of God is a just consequence, you will have to agree, for all those who break God's law. Yes, the law of God was glorious. Why was it glorious? A little bit of it brushed off into Moses, but in its pure form, it was absolutely glorious. You could not get anything better than that. You know why? Because in the glory of God, the holiness of God is displayed. We could see in the glory of God that no man on earth, because of our sinful nature, can ever, ever, ever keep the law of God. And so what the law tells us and displays to us that God is other than us. And he is holy. As we have sung this morning, holy, holy, holy. Even the angels in Isaiah 6, when they come before in the presence of God, all they sing is holy, holy, holy. So the law of God really displays it was excellent and perfect and good because it displays something of the glory of God. But also, listen to this. The law of God tells us what is right from wrong. And it shows how far short we fall. Praise God for his grace in giving us the law. If it wasn't for the law, we would, we'd, be all, we'd be all over the place. God's law, you know, it's like a mirror. You all know what a mirror is. You know, a mirror reveals how dirty our faces are. I need to look into it constantly. But just as a mirror only f- reflects what really is, it cannot in and of itself clean that dirty face up. You get the meaning? And the law of God also only reflects sin-stained hearts. But it also cannot clean them up and forgive and declare people righteous. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news of the superior covenant, new covenant. The one who accepts, the one who believes, the one who humbles himself, the one who repents of his sin and acknowledges God for who he is and comes to Christ asking for his forgiveness, knowing that he is the only one who forgives. Here's the good news. Upon that repentance and coming to Christ in belief, God will forgive But not only that, he would declare you righteous. He won't make you righteous as if you're going to be a perfect perfect person for the rest of your life because none of us are perfect, even as Christians. We still sin, right? But upon faith and repentance in Christ, toward Christ, he will declare us forever and eternally righteous. Christ is the believer's righteousness. That's what happens. He is our righteousness. Am I righteous? No. Christ is righteousness in me. And so this new ministry, this ministry of the new covenant, it not only justifies us and sanctifies us, but it also produces righteousness in us. And what that means is it gives us the wherewithal, it gives us desire, it gives us the hunger, it gives us the new bent in life to live holy lives that will please him. Before the law, the sinner is guilty and powerless, shut up to the condemnation and judgment. But it's by the gospel alone that he is offered forgiveness and power to live righteously and eternally. The ministry of the new covenant is superior in that it produces righteousness, it produces changed lives to the glory of God. Now that is what the old covenant folks could never ever do. It had some glory as we said before, it expressed the holiness of God absolutely but it is now completely outdone. It's been outmoded. It is surpassed by the new covenant because now in Jesus Christ, we not only see the demands of the law being met on our behalf in Christ, but now we see abundant grace and mercy towards sinners. What does does verse 10 say? For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory. Because of the glory that surpasses it. In other words, the diminishing splendor of the law is no match for the glory of God's grace displayed in Jesus Christ. Let's show that off, folks. Let's be a little bit more proactive in showing that off this year and the years to come. Let's not keep it suppressed 
like Jesus su- suggested that it can be and it should not be in the Sermon on the Mount. Let us not keep it suppressed. Let's not hide our inward glory that God has, has given us like a lamp under a basket. This is what Jesus says. But let your light shine before men in such a way that, you may see your, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5.16. That's what we need to do. Let's show it off. Finally, we're coming to an end here. We choose the permanent but not the temporary. We see this in verse 11. The third argument, this is the third argument for the superiority of the new covenant. It says, for if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. The old has gone and the new has come. It's certainly true in regards to the old and new covenants. But more than that, we know that Jeremiah 31, 31 says that the old covenant was not God's final revelation concerning his redemptive purposes. It wasn't. He promised a new covenant. The writer of the Hebrews picks this up, actually. Isaiah's promise. And he says, when he said a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And we know that the appointed time, as we celebrated at Christmas, at the appointed time, Christ Jesus came into the world to usher in that new covenant. In other words, even reading the Old Testament, God revealed that the old covenant that condemns was never, ever designed to be permanent. But people treat it as if it is. Folks, the gospel of God's grace has come and it has permanent glory. This means it is of eternal value and it carries permanent, glorious consequences for the believer. And we need to understand that. In conclusion, we need to understand that the ministry of the old covenant condemns transgressors and faded away at the coming of Christ. But the ministry of the new covenant is carried out in the power of the Spirit. It gives believers a right standing before God and at last because it will be not superseded by another. Hebrews 13 and 20. Nothing will supersede this. The ministry of God's grace in Christ is internal. It's written on our hearts as a letter of Christ. 1 to 3 of chapter 3 of this book. It brings life. Verse 4 to 6. So that we can sufficiently and adequately serve life. And it also carries increasing glory. So it's, a, it was, it's an internal, it's written on our heart, it brings life, and it creates increasing glory for those who are in Christ. That's what the new covenant does. What wondrous comfort and security there is for the Christian in the knowledge that the old is gone and the new has come. This makes the new covenant something and a truth That needs to strengthen our lives. We need to live triumphantly in this truth of the new covenant. Because Jesus has won the victory over our condemnation and sin. And he's imputed his righteousness to us. Whereby we can live and serve him for the glory of God. And may the Lord bless his word uh, to us this morning. I wonder if we could stand. I just want to close with a benediction. And as I read this out, this is from Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Just listen to me. This is from Hebrews 13 and 20, and we'll read this in closing. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing.